We are the Smiths. Morrissey. Johnny Marr. Mike Joyce. And Andy Rock. The Smiths. Why do we call ourselves the Smiths? We call ourselves the Smiths because you decided we were called the Smiths. And I decided because it was the most ordinary name. And I think it's time that the ordinary folk of the world showed their faces. Few bands are as hard to characterize as the Smiths. They're very much of their time, but also not really of their time. Taking influence from old school rock and roll and pop, and they also laid the groundwork for a large portion of the alternative and pop music to come since. They didn't sound like anybody else, but there was something to their songs that made it seem like they had been around since the beginning of sound. Their melodies are like nursery rhymes or lullabies, as if you grew up with these songs, even if you never heard them before. They could be full of joy, yet have a grim undertone of misery that it might be a bit hard to grasp, but nevertheless it's there. And even in the years since where this band's influence can be found from a usual suspect such as Oasis, The Stone Roses, or The Killers, to less obvious choices such as AFI and Pantera. That's true, look it up. I love the Smiths. I just think that Morrissey's a genius. And wow, look at that, they have a song called Cemetery Gate. Bingo. I'm a... Smith's no band has been able to tap into that same kind of melancholy or songwriting Morrissey, Johnny Marr, Andy Rourke, and Mike Joyce could create. Ladies and gentlemen, and anybody in between, this is the Smiths Retrospective. The Smiths were formed in 1982 by their two central figures, Stephen Morrissey and Johnny Marr. The two may now be entangled in maybe the longest running musical feud of all time, with enough blows laid against each other you'd think they were secretly in love, but from 82 to 87 they are one of the greatest musical duos within all of pop music, up there with Lennon and McCartney in my mind. They may not have been the best of friends, and they may not have gotten on as well as many fans might hope, but great tension often gives an edge to make great music. Their push and pull is what defined the band. Morrissey's voice is mesmerizing, but slightly rough around the edges, which makes him extremely relatable even when singing about how some people's mothers are bigger than other girls' mothers. And yes, I know, he's revealed himself to be quite a vile person, but for me, it doesn't do anything to diminish what he accomplished as part of the Smiths. Johnny Marr is a god among guitar players. The way he can elevate a song to never before seen heights is unmatched. The riffs he wrote are unlike anything else before or since. He made a conscious decision in the Smiths to not play any power chords and very few guitar solos, probably as a rejection of a lot of the guitar players popular at the time, and also to try and push the guitar forward, because not using power chords and solos was not so much a hindrance as it was a strength, as he could layer guitars together and create his own Phil Spector wall of sound. He would play riffs within riffs, chords within chords, I think Noel Gallagher explains it better than I can. I believe he said, even he isn't as good as he is. And it's kind of true. They recorded a demo of The Hand That Rocks the Cradle and Suffered the Children with a bassist named Dale Hibbert, and those two songs would later make the way onto the band's debut. When it came time to book their first ever live show, they came to the sudden realization that they had no drummer. So through a mutual friend of Johnny's, the band was introduced to Mike Joyce, who would become their permanent drummer. And like with every other member of this band who isn't named Morrissey or Marr, he's very much overlooked because he played in support of Morrissey and Marr, and he wasn't a focal point. And I think he and Andy Rourke deserve more credit for how well they played in support. They played to the song. Not every band needs a Neil Peart or a Cliff Burton. Bass and drums are foundational instruments, and if your foundation isn't up to scratch, your building's gonna collapse. And I think the same thing applies to the Smiths and bands like them. In Mike's case, he was exceptional at amping up a song when it needed it, bringing it down, or driving the band into a crescendo. Listen to Death of a Disco Dancer and you'll get what I mean. At their first ever gig, Morrissey's childhood friends, James Maker, joined them on stage to dance and shake maracas while wearing high heel stilettos, which Maker has fervently denied that last detail. Thankfully, he wasn't to last as an actual... member, if he ever was one to begin with. 
Del Hibbert was soon afterwards given the boot for a multitude of reasons. He was a family man and had to look after his kids. He didn't really get along with the band too great. He didn't really fit in with the guys in terms of looks, since according to him, they were trying to appear as a gay band. But Joyce has said that it was mainly because his bass playing just wasn't up to scratch, which I'm inclined to believe. He was replaced by one of Johnny's former bandmates, Andy Rourke, who, like Mike Joyce, is somewhat ignored. Which is a damn shame because, as already mentioned, just because they weren't as flashy as the other two doesn't mean they were unimportant. Andy's bass playing is the rock that didn't let Johnny go too overboard. He played along with Mars riffs and oftentimes created his own melodies within songs, while at all times keeping locked with Mike Joyce like a Chinese finger trap. After recording another demo, they were declined by EMI, but were signed to now legendary indie label Rough Trade. Though on the record contract, only Morrissey and Mars signatures appear, so in the eyes of the law, there was only two Smiths. And this will come back to bite the band later on, but we'll discuss that later. Their debut single, Hand in Glove, did well for an indie band, and likely would have done better if not for some controversy they found themselves in. And the fact they chose maybe the gayest picture of all time for the single's cover didn't really help. But their next single, This Charming Man, was a huge hit in the UK and also did pretty well in New Zealand and Australia. And with that momentum, the Smiths released their eponymous debut album in 1984. We have an album released on February the 20th, and I really do expect the highest critical praise for it. It's, it's a very, very good album. I think it's a signal post, really, in music. Do you think that by making sort of statements like that, people are going to start calling you really arrogant? You know? Yes, I do, but, you know, if you really have something and you're very sure of it, why hide? I don't understand that attitude. So I From the moment the Smiths debuted, they were almost immediately thrown into controversy. There were pedophilia accusations thrown at the band for songs like Reel Around the Fountain and The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, because if you look at the lyrics removed from any sort of nuance or context, it might seem slightly sussy-wussy. But they only seem sus if you take the words like child and references to childhood completely at face value. The Hand That Rocks the Cradle can be interpreted a few ways, but Morrissey himself has said that it's about a relationship he once had that didn't involve romance. So it makes sense why the music is reminiscent of lullabies and the sounds babies' mobiles make. And that's an aromantic relationship most have had in their life and can connect with. The opener Reel Around the Fountain is a wilting love song that invokes feelings of whimsical nostalgia. And with the opening line, it's clear, to me at least, that it's in reference to young people losing their innocence. But the rest of the lyrics make it clear that it's in a playful manner and that, you know, they enjoy it. So I don't feel that the pedophilia accusations are fair or made in good faith. This album had a really troubled production. Jeff Travis, the head of Rough Trade, suggested Troy Tate of the band The Teardrop Explodes, and he was very nurturing with the band and wanted to get the Smiths' live sound captured on record, which unfortunately, it just didn't work. The Smiths' on record is very precise and tight, which leaves room for Johnny's riffs and Morrissey's vocals to soar when needed. But the looser vibe, reverbed out drums, and overly loud bass leaves the song sounding more like demos than a finished LP. I lost my faith in woman's heart, I lost my faith in woman's heart, I lost my faith. I lost my faith in woman's heart, I lost my faith in woman's heart, I lost my faith. Thankfully, the album was re recorded with John Porter, who previously worked with Brian Ferry and Killing Joke and he understood how to polish the Smiths' sound. It's rarely reserved, but it leaves room for extravagance when the situation calls for it. Like with their first single, Hand in Glove. It has this infectious harmonica riff that'll make your heart skip a beat, with lyrics that Morrissey obtusely said is about complete loneliness, even though the words detail a loving relationship that may be looked down upon so they hide in rags. Yet they don't care because they're just so infatuated with each other. And the rags line is clearly metaphorical, but Morrissey was so poor that he would often dress in rags when he was younger. The song has been interpreted by many as being about a same-sex relationship, and I'm inclined to agree. 
but it could be about any relationship that is frowned upon. There's also a couple performances of the song with 60s singer Sandy Shaw taking the place of Morrissey, one of which being on top of the pops, which is kind of odd, but cool regardless. Morrissey was a master of winding up the media and the public at large. He knew how to make people either love him or hate him. Even today, it's almost impossible to find someone with a neutral opinion of the man. This can be seen when he was talking up this album when it came out, despite by many accounts not really liking the record in private. Suffer so Little Children is a haunting closer about the Moors murders that got them into even more controversy when the grandfather of one of the victims heard it and thought the band was trying to exploit the murders and cash in. But after meeting with Morrissey, he understood that the song was about the effect the murders had. My favorite song of this record has to be This Charming Man. I know it's trendy to say, but damn, they put everything they had into the song. Johnny's riff is one of his best of all time. I love how he's playing melodies throughout the song, completely independent of Morrissey's vocals. It makes the song sound so dense, despite being structured just like a standard peppy little pop song. Andy's bass is constantly walking up and down the fretboard, never just sticking to the root. Joyce's drums are simple, yes, but not to a fault. He plays the beat with conviction, which makes his subtle deviations flourish, and Morrissey longingly croons for a man who picked him up with pure lust in his voice. In fact, I'm surprised in Thatcher's England that a song about a homoerotic relationship was so popular. I guess it just really hit a nerve with a lot of people. A jumped up country boy who never knew his place He said, return to me We know so much about Overall, the debut Smith's album is a magnificent listen, though not quite perfect. I feel it can be a little one note at times, and some songs blend together a bit with its cutesy post-punk, but if you're in the right mood for it, this album can hit the spot like nobody's business. And for a debut album, it's commendable for them to have so many of the classic Smith's elements already within it which leaves more room for experimentation and fleshing out already present ideas in later records. But before we get to them, we're going to take the first of two detours. Obviously people get very affectionate about groups that are no longer with us, and it seemed like the death of Joy Division seemed to throw so many lights on them as a group that were never there when they existed. So. I'm personally quite skeptical. It's like the way we feel about film stars that are dead. Suddenly they're wonderful and it's such a shame. Yet when they're around, nobody really seems to care. It's like this whole thing about death. It's, um, it's quite interesting. It's fascinating. It's perhaps more fascinating than life sometimes. Now I know I am pretty much cheating by including compilations and not keeping it to just studio LPs like I normally do, but I do that because compilations are usually pretty skippable and non-essential. But not in the Smiths case. Oftentimes the non-album singles and b-sides are some of the Smiths most defining songs, and they eventually would make their way into compilations like this, and thanks to great sequencing and some other choice cuts, they would make essential listening experiences in their own right, just as much as any of their studio records. And since this band only has four studio albums, I thought, why not include them? Besides, how can I make a Smiths retrospective without shining a light on songs like Heaven Knows I'm Miserable Now? As dire as the lyrics are, it's paired with drop-dead gorgeous music written by Marr after he got Seymour Stein to buy him a Gibson 335. It adds more layers as it goes on, and it's such a pleasure compared to Morrissey's infectious but mopey melodies. It's reminiscent of old pop songs from the 50s and 60s, which makes sense because the title is cribbed from a Sandy Shaw song, Heaven Knows I'm Missing Him Now, but still unmistakably Smiths. I mean, how many times did you hear references to Roman empires and old Ronette songs? In my life, oh why do I give valuable time to people who don't care if I A 
lot of this album also contains a lot of songs from the BBC Radio 1 sessions from mid-83. And the only problem with this is some of the songs in those sessions were also on the debut. So it's the only time when listening to this album that it really feels like a compilation. But even then, they're not bad versions, just different. I know for a fact that many prefer these versions, but not me sadly. And even though some songs are performed live in the studio, they don't sound too different from your standard studio recordings by the Smiths. Maybe not quite as polished, but still fantastic. My favorites of the BBC Radio 1 session songs is probably This Night Has Opened My Eyes. It's a morose romp that retells the events of the play A Taste of Honey, Morrissey once again showing off his love of old plays and literature. I think Rourke is the MVP of this song. His subtle but always moving bass line is eerie, and Johnny's sparing licks are the cherry on top. Girl Afraid is a nervy piece of post-punk, Please 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 Let Me Get What I Want is as direct as it is brief, and full of sorrow. And even though the succinctness is what a lot of people, including myself, like about the song, I still wish it went on for just a little bit longer. I mean, that harpsichord or whatever it is at the end is to die for. Though the song I've been dancing around this whole time, How Soon Is Now, is maybe the best Smith song ever put to tape. Not really my favorite, but on an objective level, I feel this song stands head and shoulders above the rest. It's a majestic piece that is Johnny Marr's mission statement of where it wants to take the guitar, through the use of layering and multitudes of effects. It can compose something that not even a full sympathy could really quite replicate the same way. It soars along with Morrissey during the chorus, but delves back into the depths during the instrumental sections. I love the weird percussive riff played by John Porter, which reminds me of early industrial. The lyrics are a mix of references to classic literature, Morrissey pleading to be loved and adored, just like everybody else, which is heartbreaking but sadly realistic. I maybe like Hatful of Hollow even more than the debut, though I technically shouldn't count it, I'm aware. I feel it has more going on with it, with the varied instruments used and the experimentation. Whereas the first album was relatively one note, at least compared to Hatful. Despite this album feeling slightly uneven, and in most cases preferring the versions of these songs and the debut compared to the BBC sessions. I think the statement is, is well, self-explanatory really. And we use it because we feel that um, popular music should be used in order to make serious statements. Because um, so many groups sell masses and masses of records and don't raise people's level of consciousness in any direction. And we find that quite sinful, especially in uh, these serious times. For the band's official sophomore release, this time on Sire Records as well as Rough Trade, the band did not shy away from igniting controversy like they did when their first album dropped the year prior, though this time more intentionally, by making themselves incredibly political, by aligning with some at the time fringe movements and political ideas, including, but not limited to, vegetarianism and animal rights, railing against Thatcher like any good Samaritan, and the growing campaign to outlaw corporal punishments, which wouldn't be outlawed in the UK until at least another two years. And the opening track, The Headmaster Ritual, is a particularly vicious attack since it's something the band had first-hand experience with. The lyrics came from Morrissey's Christian secondary school education, which he later talked about saying, The education I received was so basically evil and brutal. All I learned was to have no self-esteem and to feel ashamed without knowing why. Please excuse me from Jim. Johnny 
Johnny Marr is famously not a very big fan of this album, and just called it one of the weakest albums in the Smith's discography. He says that as a guitar player, he has a tendency to speed things up, and meet his murder, he thinks really suffers from this. And now I do kind of get what he means here. A lot of these songs on this album can go a little too hard, and the songs don't feel as varied as they really are. As brilliant as songs like Nowhere Fast, I Want the One I Can't Have, and What She Said are. But this album still delivers new sounds. It was the first Smiths album to be self-produced with help from engineer Steven Street. The band would sample old BBC sound effect records that Morrissey owned to build lavish soundscapes that had never really been heard before. These soundscapes can be heard on Barbarianism Begins at Home with this absolutely infectious bass line from Andy that actually still is my attention away from even Johnny's funky riffs. It makes the song sound like a roller disco before an apocalypse. Lyrically, it's about the inverse of the headmaster ritual. It's still about corporal punishment, but it's from the teacher or conservative authority figure's perspective. A crack on the head is what you get for asking. A crack on the Maybe the most contentious part of this album is the titular issue that it tackles, being animal rights and vegetarianism, which lays into the joke of, how do you know someone's vegan or vegetarian? Don't worry, they'll tell you. you Morrissey pissed off a lot of people by his own arrogance, slagging off Thatcher and Band-Aid, but the vegetarian thing is something a lot of people still hate him for, which is valid because he is still very vocal and a bit of a dick about it. But even speaking as a non-vegan or vegetarian, as of right now, he's kinda got a point. Not eating meat is better for the environment, it's better for you, and it lessens the suffering of animals. Now I'm not saying that indigenous hunter-gatherer villages need to go out and start buying beyond meat, but let's be real, anti-veganism is pured by pure misguided pettiness. Sure, I'll concede, some vegans and vegetarians are just assholes, I mean, just look at Morrissey. But some callous words alone shouldn't deter people from something that has way more benefits than drawbacks. Unless, of course, you're a little beta boy snowflake. In the song Meat is Murder, the title track dives right into the nitty gritty, evoking imagery of the awful slaughterhouses that outright destroy these beautiful and amazing animals just to fill the bellies of people who are either willfully ignorant or take pride in the killie because it makes them feel like they're on top of the food chain. It samples disturbing baas from sheep and cries of cows, caked in reverb delay, combined with the instrumental, it just makes the song outright haunting. Even just describing the meat as flesh drives the point home that they're not that different from us. It's death for no reason, and death for no reason is murder. It's not natural love of our kind, the flesh you so fancifully fry. Meat is Murder is once more a cut above what came before it. <laughs> By tackling more subjects other than a young love with their own loneliness, it made the Smiths such an important and vital band to more people than ever. This one album I'm sure put more people off eating meats than any garbage pita's ever spewed out, I'll say that much. Sure, some songs maybe go a bit too fast at times, and Johnny Marr isn't too much of a fan. But those songs are still great, and changes of pace like Rush Home Ruffians, That Jokes and Funny More, and Well I Wonder make it so most people never notice or even care. Why do you think people do accuse you of arrogance? Because I know the music press have got a really rather funny tack towards you. Yes, they do. I think they, I mean, this, this again sounds arrogant, but I think they probably feel that I'm somewhat too clever to do what I do. I don't think many journalists are really used to people who are making records having a very clear clear statements and very clear vision of where they want to go it's very unusual and when it happens it makes it a lot of The Queen is Dead is an album with such a mystique of adoration surrounding it. More than the band itself, it's the Led Zeppelin or rumors of indie rock. And on paper, it might seem funny on the surface because it's not too different from the previous Smiths albums or even the ones that came later. There's not one new element to their sound you can easily point to as to why this is by far the fan favorite record. 
I mean, look at this poll I put up on my community tab. Now, I knew it would win, but Jesus, nothing else even came close. And you'd be hard pressed to find a hipster topster made online without finding this record, including my own. And you might ask why. Well, I think it was simply the band just at the top of their game. The stakes felt higher, Morrissey's at his most vicious and tender, and Johnny's arrangements are richer and even more extravagant. You can feel it on the title track. It's chaotic, but tight and controlled. I particularly love Andy's bass line with the chorus effect on it and Morrissey's searing vocals. But on the other hand, we have songs like I Know It's Over, which is minimal in its instrumentation, with lyrics that are just heartbreaking. It's one of the songs you could hear at 2 in the morning while sitting at your bed and just feel every word pour over you as you feel peace knowing that someone else out there gets it. I think another reason why this album gets so much praise is compared to their previous albums, The Queen Is Dead has more variation to be found in subject matter and in the styles these tracks take form in. As much as I love the debut in Meet Is Murder and Headful of Hollow, they can feel a little repetitive at times, but this album never lets an idea or a feeling become overbearing. Like frankly Mr. Shankly with its joyous ska riffs, the beat courtesy of Mike Joyce written about the HATRED you hold for your dickish boss or superior. There are rumors that the song was written about the head of Gruff Trade, Jeff Travis, which would make sense as they were having some difficulties with their label at this time, but the band has always denied this. I mean, writing a diss track towards your boss is a great way to get fired. Cemetery Gates is a peppy song that sees Marcy reminiscing about when he used to playfully walk through the graveyard with his friend, while also responding to criticism about how he would interpolate lyrics and poems from old movies, plays, songs, you name it. He does this by quoting several poems, the movie, the man who came to dinner, and Shakespeare. And in snarky, Morrissey fashion, the band etched the Oscar Wilde quote, talent borrows, genius steals, into the runout grooves for the Big Mouth Strikes Again singles. The song was also almost scrapped because Johnny didn't think the guitar part was interesting enough, but thankfully, Morrissey convinced him that it should be on the record regardless. Big Mouth Strikes Again is an energetic romp with a percussive riff, bizarre backing vocals, and Morrissey musing on the music press and how he would be taken out of context and often shown in the worst possible light in the tabloids. I mean, at this point, we're only a few years removed from being branded as pedophiles by the press so I could totally see why he would be pissed off. You might say that the Joan of Arc references are a bit pretentious, but evoking the imagery of Joan of Arc and her legacy makes this song become much more about a broader issue than just Morrissey bitching and moaning about people being mean to him, so I can definitely excuse it. Another song dealing with the pressures of the music industry is The Boy with a Thorn in His Side. And Morrissey was a titular boy, and the thorn in question are music industry people who wouldn't sign them, wouldn't play them on the radio, would disparage them, and just wouldn't give the band a chance. It's a song that's endearingly pathetic, and the band sell it with gorgeous, albeit fake strings and instrumentation. Pickering to Tutu is post-punk rockabilly with lyrics about as irreverent as the post-punk and rockabilly mixture is. Johnny called it a throwaway, and while it's by no means my favorite Smith song, I still love it. Some Girls Are Bigger Than Others is a little weird, but the haunting jangly riff at the Volk performance makes it somehow work. Then we have There Is A Light That Never Goes Out, by many accounts the band's signature song and their most iconic for good reason. If you put a gun to my head and told me to pick my favorite Smith song, I'd probably pick this one. As poserish of an answer that is, because it's just that good. The lyrics deal with an almost toxic dependency of someone with no place to call home, but has someone he has an attachment to. Someone he can be with and feel like he is home. Someone he would happily die with in gruesome ways, as described in the chorus. But as long as he is with them, he is happy. And even though he is literally nothing else, he has them. 
And that is the light that never goes out. That longing for opportunity. That person who means the world to you. It could be anything as long as you look to it and smile. Which is funny for me to get something so positive out of this song, considering how dire it sounds, with the eerie fake orchestration that sounds like something you hear in a funeral while an epitaph is being read. I mean, it's a song that means a lot to me, and if you're this far into the video, it's likely that this song also means a lot to you. Some records have the adoration they deserve, and The Queen is Dead is definitely one of them. And it's amazing that an album like this is so widely beloved when we all have albums in our lives that we love, but languish in obscurity. But at least we can all take solace in the fact that The Queen is Dead is rightfully so seen as a milestone album that it is. Yeah, I know it shouldn't matter what other people say and think when it comes to music we enjoy, and I agree. But I'm happy that every year there's teenagers out there digging into their parents' record collection or browsing Spotify and listening to this album and letting it change their life. It's a beautiful thing. I don't see why pop should be silly. I mean, they never, they never um, display classical music in a silly way with a, with, with a, you know, a 90-piece orchestra jumping into a big foam box, do they? So why should they do it with popular music? And the big question is why? What really is happening? To me, it's political. I see it as totally political. It's like um, deliberately not reflecting the times, deliberately not reflecting anything that occurs in 1987. Louder Than Bombs was the last release of the Smiths while they were still together. Though it's not a studio album, it's a double album compilation, not dissimilar to Hatful of Hollow, intended purely for the US audience since a lot of these songs had never been released there prior. But that didn't stop UK fans from importing it in droves, so it was soon released in the UK as well. Most of the track list is made up of B-sides, 18 out of 24 tracks in fact. And with it being mostly B-sides, you might think it's nothing special and just something to release on a whim for the American markets. But the Smiths' B-sides are all fantastic. There's a case to be made that the band's B-sides are better than any of their A-sides and album tracks. Seriously, it's a mystery why some of these tracks are relegated to being B-sides, a sign to many of a song being mediocre at best. We have London, which is by far the most cutthroat song of their career. It's a song owing a lot to the punk bands the Smiths were influenced by, like the New York Dolls, with enough of their own Smiths flair for it to not feel too out of place next to, you know, this charming man. It's a song with no real chorus, it just hits you with three intense verses, one after another, with no let up in sight. You feel like you're on a train that's stuttering out of control and it's about to crash. Apart from the B-sides, there's some songs we have already discussed like Hand in Glove and Heaven Knows I'm Miserable Now, and there's also some new singles that were recorded while the band was briefly a five-piece. In early 1986, Andy Rourke was kicked out for his heroin habits and was replaced by Craig Gannon. A fortnight later, Andy rejoined the band and Craig moved to rhythm guitar. He remains in the band until October of 86. He left the band citing a dislike he and the rest of the band shared. We just didn't like each other. Uh, we'd just be in the same room and it was just a nightmare, it was just a horrible atmosphere, really frosty. So you, the first thing you want to do is just walk out, really. And it's a real shame as the band never sounded better live than they did with Craig. That extra guitar went a long way in making them sound huge. And it played into Johnny's ethos of playing guitar, with a number of overdubs he would add in the studio to make the guitar tracks into an orchestra, and having just one more guitar helped it come across in a live setting. There's only so much one guitar can do even when Johnny Marr is playing it. By far the biggest song Craig Gannon played on was Panic, and he was even in the video. The song is an angry look at the current state of pop music and the radio in England. 
The song sparked into existence after Johnny and Morrissey were listening to the radio, and DJ Steve Wrights followed in news reports about the nuclear disaster in Chernobyl by playing I'm Your Band by Wham. Morrissey thought it was abhorrent and wrote a song calling for the burning down of discos and the hanging of a DJ. Can you guess what DJ they meant? Johnny has said that this anecdote about Steve Wrights was exaggerated, and apparently I'm Your Man was long since gone from the charts at the time, but it still makes for a scornful and remorseless attack on pop music and pop culture. Other singles include the infectious Ask, which has this amazing and subtle vocoded vocal that works so well as another instrument when most vocoded vocal tracks would likely be used as the musical centerpiece. And the song was later the cause of a court case between Craig Gannon and Morrissey and Johnny Marr for supposedly being cheated out of songwriting credits for the song, as well as unpaid wages from touring. You Just Haven't Earned It Yet Baby is a haunting song that describes the reason for the mistreatments a lot of people face with simply not earning the rights to be treated decently yet. Which can be laughed off, but I think there's a lot of truth to these lyrics. It wasn't released as a single in favor of Shoplifters of the World, an anti-capitalistic song that borrows words from Marx and Engels, and borrows a hook from T-Rex. But this song spins the words on its head and is more about spiritual or cultural shoplifting. Whatever that means, Morrissey. The B-side to that song is Half a Person, about a longing crush which is never given a chance to flourish, only for her to later write to him and say that she liked him better when he was poor. Like how success can change you or change the way in which people perceive you. The song also has references to his own insecurities and his sexuality and Morrissey's support of feminism. Funnily enough, in this love song of sorts, we don't get to know much about who Morrissey actually has a crush on. We mostly get anecdotes about himself and how obsessed he is with this person in question. And after fawning for this person for over six years, all he asks for in return is five seconds of her time to tell her the story of his life. And if you have five seconds to spare, then I'll tell you the story of my life. Sixteen clumsy and shy, I went to London and died. I put myself in at the Y. Golden Lights is a really good cover, originally from singer-songwriter Twinkle. It features vocals from Christy McCall, and they're simply put, heavenly. And there's a lot of effects on Morrissey's vocals, which some might hate, but I like it as it differentiates itself from the original. Also, fun fact, a lot of people call this the worst Smith song ever. I don't think I agree, really. Oscillate Wildly is one of very few Smith's instrumentals, and it's fantastic. Back to the Old House is as soothing as it is morose. But my favorite track is the closer, Sleep. And I won't lie, it's at least half the reason why I was so adamant about Louder Than Bombs being included. I can't think of a song I've listened to more while laying driftless and sleepless in bed at like 2 in the morning, thanks to my insomnia. I, like I'm sure many of you, first heard the song in Perks Being a Wallflower, to this day still one of my favorite all-time films, and I'm pretty sure it's at least part of the reason why the song has become one of the band's most beloved and biggest songs. I mean, just scrolling through the YouTube comments for the song, you'll find a good few references to that movie. It's an aching and gut-wrenching song that reads like a suicide note put to song. And being someone with depression, I sometimes have those nights where I can't fall asleep and just want to end it. Period. So I can relate to this song a lot. And unfortunately, due to my insomnia, I have those nights more often than I like to admit. The simple piano is just like background noise while Morrissey just pleads to be, quote, sang to sleep. Along with the sound of wind that can be heard throughout the song, reminding me of the calm quiet of the night, when these thoughts might enter your head. This song is a chilling example of pure emotional exhibitionism. You can say what you want about Morrissey, but the way he's able to come across as an old friend through song, talking about his, and by extension your emotions, is why he's still such a beloved figure to millions. That mobile playing a lullaby at the end? Man. Sing me to sleep, sing me to sleep. I don't want to wake up on my own anymore Sing to me Sing to me Louder Than Bombs is an album of mostly b-sides that towers above many other bands' greatest hits. 
The selection of songs, the sequencing, the songwriting are far better than a compilation like this frankly should be. It's just another way that this band stuck out from the crowd. Though in 1987, the Smiths were an absolute mess. Johnny felt overworked, they had issues with their label Rough Trade, issues which were the reason why The Queen Is Dead was put on hold for being released for like half a year, and Morrissey and Johnny Marr just couldn't really work together anymore. There's been plenty of reasons as to why they broke up. Johnny was displeased with Morrissey's unwillingness to grow as an artist, and Morrissey didn't like the idea of Johnny working with other musicians. Morrissey has also cited a lack of a manager and business problems, and Johnny has cited a dislike for covering artists such as Scylla Black. I've even heard fans speculate that Johnny was forced to leave by his wife because she was afraid that Morrissey was madly in love with him and was trying to steal him away from her. But the main thing that instigated the split was an article published by NME while Johnny was on vacation entitled Smiths to Split, which leaked the band's personal grumbles and said that Johnny had already left. Johnny believed that Morrissey leaked this to the press to beat him to the punch or something, and that was that, and that's what made him leave for real. But before they split, they had recorded their very last album to be released on September 28th, 1987. Johnny gets back on his holidays and there's um, a massive piece in the enemy saying uh, Johnny Mars left the Smiths. And, and that was like the first he'd heard of it, but I think he was that pissed off about it and where it might have come from. That he said, right, you know, I've had enough anyway and yeah, I have left. I'd like to think it's because in reality, whether what anybody says, it's maybe because we'd run it, it's, it run its course. It had a beginning, a middle, and an end. With the Smiths on another level, I really do think it is true. I think this is really more or less the the end of the story. The legacy of Strange Ways Here We Come is a weird one because it's the swan song of a band who by many accounts were about to fall apart spectacularly. So you might expect something like Fleetwood Mac's rumors in terms of songs written by other members and a somewhat hostile vibe in some tracks, but no. It's very simply put, another album from the Smiths. It was just the last one. There were rumors of the band breaking up while they were in the recording process for this album, but Stephen Street said that they had a good time during the recording, and that the band were in high spirits while working at the Woolhall studio, which was at the time owned by Tears for Fears. And because it had a wine cellar, the band and Stephen Street would stay up all night, sans Morrissey, drinking and covering Spinal Tap songs. And while I call this album just another Smiths album, that's not a completely truthful statement. Johnny wants to push their sound further, looking at records like the White Album and early material from the Walker Brothers. It wants it to get away from the quote, jingle jangle of their previous albums. This could be heard in new instrumentation at play, especially in songs like In Girlfriend in a Coma, which includes uh, lush string arrangements, and unlike string arrangements in previous albums, it's real strings. Originally it was more reggae, which is kind of weird, and I can't quite see them doing reggae. But if you listen to the guitar, you can still hear Johnny playing a ska strumming pattern. And it also has a video, but like the other video from this album, it only includes Morrissey, as the band were already broken up by this point, and both videos Morrissey calls unwatchable. And it's also one of a couple of songs that could be analogous of the imminent breakup of the band. No, I don't want to see her. Do you really think Unhappy Birthday is a real petty and spiteful song to direct at anyone you dislike, but still care about to some extent. I love the line, And if you should die, I may feel slightly sad, but I won't cry. Pain's a Vulgar Picture is a song with a lot of ire points towards the record companies and the music industry as a whole. It's about how the labels can suck you dry and how they will often capitalize off of tragedies of like a musician's death by releasing reissues, repackages, things of the like to milk the artist even more while feigning about how much they actually loved them and cared about them. Which is very hard to believe in majority of cases. The band had recently signed with EMI, the same label who had rejected them years later. And signing with a label that was so openly blasted by many, including most notably the Sex Pistols 10 years prior, caused some outrage. And EMI had also done something like the song is describing to T-Rex after Mark Bowen died, and later with Queen after Freddie Mercury died. You could see why it was on Morrissey's mind. My favorite track of this album is most definitely Last Night I Dreamt That Somebody Loved Me. 
a song frequently touted as the band's best track by both Marr, Morrissey, but also David Bowie and even Andre 3000 from Outkast. It's as sweeping and as atmospheric as any film score, it's maybe the most miserable tune in the band's catalog, and as I've already showcased in this video, that is quite the compliment. <laughs> Johnny acts as the conductor for the song, it's so dense but easily identifiable, it's a mood piece if I've ever heard one and has this dreamlike quality at first, but as soon as the vocals kick in and Morrissey's paint performance permeates through your speakers, you feel like you just woke up to pure grief. Last night I had that somebody loved me No hope, no harm Just another false alarm Stop me if you think you've heard this one before and I started something I couldn't finish, or more typical Smith's Affair, though still fantastic. The former, in fact, was censored by the BBC on account of the easily missable line, which they thought would have been linked to the very recent Hungerford Massacre, where some lunatic decides to kill about 16 people before thankfully pulling an Arbud Dwyer. Despite the censorship, it was still released as a single in other markets, but it probably still kneecapped this album's sales. I could easily see this being a hit. As much as I enjoy this album, I feel it could have ended better. Don't get me wrong, I at least enjoy every song of this album, but I feel the tracklist could have been edited to better represent this album as the swan song. But since it was written before they knew they were going to break up, they approached it just like any other record. But I feel at the very least they could have swapped Death of One's Elbow and Death of a Disco Dancer. The former is a fun little ditty, but it's by far my least favorite. Death of a Disco Dancer, on the other hand, is a song that muses about Morrissey's frustrations with people's seeming apathy to the rampant injustices of the world. Like so many other tracks, you can also connect it to the band's breakup if you want. It's a slow, building song with a fantastic crescendo that never lets up. Mike Joyce in particular is fantastic on this track as he drives it towards that finish line, but surely letting it all break apart into a cacophonic musical bloodbath. The very last song, I Won't Share You, is probably the most clear-cut case of Morrissey writing about the band's breakup. There are other songs you can make a case for, but I think any other connections to the state of the band's internal affairs and other tracks is probably coincidental. But I Won't Share You, I think is the only real example of it. Johnny has said himself that they're in high spirits during the recording and writing, though I Won't Share You is showcasing such a minimal instrumentation and such a pained performance from Morrissey that I can't help but connect the dots. Keep in mind, he never really wanted to leave the Smiths, and he never wanted the band to stop, at least at the time. And he disliked it when Johnny played with other musicians. There was a reason why, at least for a little while, Morrissey's solo band was comprised of every other member of the Smiths, sans Morrissey. He even used Stephen Street as his producer for his first album and a couple of singles afterwards. And despite its minimalism, I still feel it's a perfect ending track for the band. Life tends to come and go as long as you know, no, 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 And that was that. The Smiths were no more. And whether they liked it or not, Strange Ways does an overall good job at saying goodbye for the band. I wish that maybe the track list would have been changed a tad bit, as I feel it's a bit top heavy, but there's no denying the quality of these tracks. And this album somewhat suffers, as none of it was ever played live by the band and the promotional budget was by many accounts lacking, and one of its singles couldn't even be played in the UK. I mean, it sold and charted well, but it's by far the least talked about album from fans, and you won't find many saying it's their favorite. Which is a real shame since it's fantastic and has some definite career highlights. Hell, Morrissey, Marr, and even Mike Joyce have all said it's their favorite Smiths release. And unlike a lot of other bands in the indie alternative scene who broke up, the Smiths just never reunited. At all. And it's not for lack of demand, there's been offers with millions of dollars on the table to do so, but they have denied it every time. The closest we have gotten is Andy Rourke joining Johnny Marr on stage a grand total of two times, one in 2006 and one in 2014, to perform How Soon Is Now. And in interviews, most of them have said that they're not really interested, to put it lightly. They all say the same thing, 
and that the Smiths had run its course. For a while, Johnny seemed open to the idea, but after Morrissey decided to once again insert his foot into his mouth by insulting Johnny for having the gall to mention him in interviews from time to time, he once again has no want to work with him ever again. I mean, if an interviewer asked Johnny a question relating to the Smiths or Morrissey, is he supposed to just not answer it? Should he instead be like Morrissey and just never give interviews so he doesn't have to mention his former bandmates? Wait, is that why Morrissey never gives interviews? Is he that petty? Eh, probably. Johnny said that in the mid-2000s, he and Morrissey were in talk for a proper union without Joyce, likely due to the lawsuit, we'll come back to this later, and it was agreed that they would make it official after Johnny was done with his commitments to the Cribs, a band he was playing with at the time. But after a week or so, Morrissey went dark on him and put a kibosh on that. After the Smiths, Morrissey started a very successful solo career with a lot of his fellow Smiths joining him for a little while. In fact, he had literally everyone from the Smiths days, not counting Marr. Even Craig Gannon played guitar for him. His debut album, Viva Hate, had no other Smiths but had Stephen Streets writing all the music and playing all the bass and half the guitar. His next two singles, as well as a B-side, however, included mostly other Smiths, but he decided not to use them any more than for a few songs and some live shows, probably for the sake of distinction. Johnny played with the Pretenders, the The, formed a supergroup called Electronic with Bernard from New Order. He's also appeared on albums by the Pet Shop Boys, Brian Ferry, Talking Heads, Crowded House, Pearl Jam, and Oasis, which should surprise nobody. He's also, in more recent years, gone out on his own as a solo act, and I have liked what I've heard from his solo output. He was also involved with the Amazing Spider-Man 2 soundtrack, and uh, the less said about that, the better. <laughs> Mike Joyce would later work with Julian Cope, Suede, The Buzzcocks, and Pill. Andy Rourke would later work with Sinead O'Connor, The Pretenders, like Johnny, Ian Brown, and would form the supergroup's Free Bass, featuring Peter Hook and Manny from The Stone Roses, and Dark with Dolores O'Riordan from The Cranberries. But the main thing people remember about the rhythm section of the Smiths post-breakup is the lawsuit that they pursued against Morrissey and Johnny Marr over how much money they were paid. As it turns out, it wasn't a 25-25-25-25 split as you would expect, but instead a 40-40-10-10 split with Morrissey and Marrett getting the lion's share. They both argued in courts that Rourke and Joyce were always aware of this agreement and that they were more important members so they deserved to be paid four times as much on top of the songwriting royalties they both received. And I really hate this sort of thing with bands. You mostly see it with solo acts or hired guns in bands, which I still think is kind of lame, but you know, I do understand it. But in cases like this, the greed is sickening. First off, I don't believe Mike Joyce or Andy Rourke agreed to it because why would you agree to that? And their argument that they were just more important is so lame. Sure, they wrote the songs, I get that, but they're already being paid songwriting royalties, which makes sense Joyce and Rourke wouldn't see that money and that's why they never asked for that money. But for every bit of merch, every show, every performance royalty on their records, they got less than half compared to Morrissey and Marr. I didn't know how else to describe it other than it being simply not fair. Marr and Morrissey alone were not the Smiths. Sure, they were the most easily identifiable when they were pushed to the center, but they were the guitarist and frontman. Of course they were the most identifiable when they were pushed to the center. That's why in Van Halen, most people know Eddie Van Halen and David Lee Roth. In Black Sabbath, most people know Ozzy and Tony Iommi. But that doesn't take away from the importance of Geezer Butler, Bill Ward, Michael Anthony, or Alex Van Halen. It just means they're not in the spotlight as much. And in this video, I've showcased several songs where I felt Joyce and Rourke shined. Simply put, it wouldn't be the Smiths without those two guys giving Morrissey and Marr the right backbone to flourish with what they do. I mean, listen to this charming man without bass. It's simply put, cursed as fuck. They offered Andy Rourke a plea for about 18k, and since he was broke at the time and didn't want the stress of the lawsuit to continue, he agreed. Mike Joyce, on the other hand, continued, and rightfully so, cleaned the fuck up. And Morrissey, in classic Morrissey fashion, delayed paying him by using loopholes of him living in the US. Stay classy, Steven. And that was the Smiths, the music, and their very troubling history. But despite the terrible shit Morrissey has been known to spew, it's not even worth talking about in my opinion. At least relating to the Smiths. 
The Marcy you see today is not the same guy you hear in The Queen is Dead, as far as I'm concerned. In five short years, this band released enough classic material to hang with any truly prolific and influential artist you can think of. They represented a changing tide in rock music that bands in their wake took and ran with, and it's a domino effect you still see in effect to this day. And I'm more than fine with them never getting back together. Sure, I'd love it if they did, but they made their statements and got out before it got stale. And if they continued on like the Stones or something, I can't imagine it not becoming stale at some point. And to leave people wanting more is way better than letting everybody get sick of you. There was never a band like them before, and it's likely that there'll never be one quite like them ever again. And I'm okay with that. Lots of the words that I write are about school and about the horrible times that I had. And in a strange way, it's like revenge on all those horrible teachers that made life miserable for me. So I think it really should be a lesson to all present day teachers that they really have to treat their pupils with maximum care. Because who knows, in the future, all the pupils of the world could sign to record companies and get their revolting revenge. Subscribe to Disco Pidmids.